This is episode 94 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 94 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Marco Ugbaba on the show and you can bet that I've tried to pronounce that several times and finally I'm just starting to get it. But uh, Marco is an incredibly awesome investor that's only been at it for one and a half years, but the guy is full of energy, he's full of determination, and I absolutely know he's gonna do some really big things in the coming years. But what he's done so far is he's assembled a portfolio that cash flows $7,500 a month. He's getting up to $2,000 a month projected cash flow on the projects he's working on right now. And again, only been in the business for a year and a half. He's a realtor in that business for approximately a year and a half as well, but he's learning very quickly. Uh, you would definitely not know it to speak to him. He's uh, he's a very, very savvy investor, and this was a really cool conversation. So I think you're gonna enjoy it. Just before we get into it, please make sure that you're hitting the subscribe button. You've already left a review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to leave me a comment, give me a thumbs up, and make sure you hit that notification bell so you get notified every time there's a new episode, which is every Sunday. And if you are new to this podcast, as always, I recommend going right back to episode one so that you could benefit from all the incredible guests that have been on this show. And of course, we dig right into the nuts and bolts of the calculations and the basic concepts in those earlier episodes, which I don't do as much of these days uh, just for natural reasons. So without further ado, please enjoy this awesome episode with Marco Agbaba. Marco, if I screwed that up, I apologize, but I'm trying here. Anyways, enjoy. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have a stone cold killer on the podcast <laughs> today. Marco, and I'm going to let you say the last name. Agbaba. Okay. It's close on your Instagram story. I tried. Yeah, no, that's, that's a tough one. The first time I saw that, I'm like, um, no, <laughs> my, my dad saw it. And my dad was like, why did that guy say sorry about your dad? I'm like, oh, no, he said sorry because he butchered the oh, last name. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, you drove all the way up for uh, from Windsor. That's right. And um, Marco, you're doing crazy stuff. And I feel like not enough people know about what you're doing. Which, when I posted that, people actually responded to me and saying, "Glad that Marco's getting out oh, really? into the uh, the spotlight here." So I'm still wondering why I'm here. So good yeah, to know. Well, yeah, I'm glad glad you're here. So, anyways, Marco, um, we're working together on a couple of things, mm -hmm. uh, helping you with some some development construction stuff. Tell uh, tell our listeners and viewers what you're up to. Yeah. So um, right now I have five properties in Windsor. I don't do any joint ventures. I know. I think you had Kellen on here as well. I think he does know joint ventures as well, right? Kellen was just uh, singing the praises of the no joint venture. Yeah. So you're about to hear it again. So Andrew's audience here. So yeah, no joint ventures. Um, so right now I'm doing my first student housing development, which is probably why you're having me on the podcast today. Um, and that's what you're helping me with as well. So pretty, pretty pumped up for that. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of cool. I've, I've been enjoying it and also a little envious of the cash flow you're getting down there. <laughs> so uh, Marco and I talk pretty regularly and, and he's uh, he's mentioning to me how much cash flow he's getting down there. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're getting and, and how, you know, how you come across that. What do you got to do to get that kind of cash flow? Right. Well, it depends on which property. Uh, for example, I'll say one that's already done. Um, so I have a duplex on California Avenue. So it's about one street away from the university. That one's cash flow is about 3300 per month. Um, keep in mind, I haven't refinanced, so like I have like 60% equity in that one. Um, but this new development, for example, after the refinance, all of the money's out. We're looking at about two thousand dollars per month cash flow for for that. Two thousand a month. Mm -hmm. So, so I think you were throwing out some numbers to me. Like, what do you add as a portfolio? But you have five properties. You just bought yeah. the fifth. But even yeah. before that, you were already at quite a nice cash flow number. Right. Yeah. Like I hit the financial independence, whatever you call it, uh, when I was 23. So that was actually only with two properties that I hit that. So we're far exceeded that point now. And what was financial independence for you? Like how much did you um, like I think I was making like 5,500 a month cash flow. So at that that's point, after right? maintenance, after... I, I maintain it myself, right? So I don't do property management and like even cutting the grass and stuff is, is done by me. Um, with repairs, when we renovate the properties, typically there's not really that many repairs that go along with it. Um, so if you want to factor in like a 5% or 10%, you can. So that's not including uh, a maintenance fee there. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're just giving, yeah, I'm pretty conservative when I come up with a cash flow number, but even still. So then you mm -hmm. added on properties after that, two more. So, so right, you're up to yeah. four. And well, then so these, so the two, I actually bought a property. I don't know if you knew or not, like three days ago. I saw it on your story. Right. So. Yeah. So just for this podcast to have something to yeah. talk about, right? Well, some, you gotta, material. gotta look like a big shot. <laughs> no. So uh, once all of the projects are done, we'll be at around 9,500 per month uh, cash flow. That's with this new construction done. And then also this duplex conversion 
will be at about 9500 per month again okay. not including your uh your maintenance so not including maintenance right. so if you want to throw five percent on on there um maybe a few thousand dollars you want to add in there but right. uh, not that's it's not even that much actually it shouldn't be a, a few thousand maybe a thousand across all the properties it's not much yeah and keep in mind one of them as well is going to be brand new development so uh, as long as my uh, coach yeah. does a does a good job walking yeah. you through it we, we should be able to avoid some repairs there <laughs> yeah so so one of the reasons when when you reached out to me and kind of mm -hmm. wanted a little help with the development and the construction side is kind of knowing how to gc yourself and, mm -hmm. and how to do that efficiently because there's obviously when you get quotes from contractors, and this is what I encountered, is they just they make your deal not work sometimes. Of course, not always. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not trying to label all, uh, but I'm as people know, I'm a control freak. So I like to control my process. Not that I won't hire out help and sub, but you know, subcontract. Mm -hmm. But general contracting yourself, why do you see a value in that? Well, because the whole reason I went to Windsor was to become a real estate developer. Like that's the only reason that I'm here. So it just doesn't make any sense for me to get a contractor to do it when I want to be that right. Well, some developers still hire contractors, right? It's, they do I like the marketing those, and... I consider those two separate things. Like developing is kind of getting all the permits and approvals, approvals getting ready to go. Right. Not necessarily permits, mm -hmm. but taking something where it was single family and getting it zoned and, and a site plan approved for a right. triplex. That's what I would consider the development stage. And then you obviously transition into construction. I think they're kind of different, different mm -hmm. skill sets. I like the complete package. So like my, um, the person that I worked for, which is the biggest student housing developer in all of Canada, they did everything in-house. Like even the architecture firm was in-house. Yeah. Um, design studio, construction, everything. Um, and that's kind of the way I want to do it as well. So I want it like an all-in-one package. Yeah. And that's the way uh, Valor and ProFunds are here is they, they, they've, they started as just kind of the mm -hmm. capital arm for developers. And then they started bringing the development in-house. Now they have urban planners in-house. They've got the mortgage brokerage in-house, right. the equity raise in-house. Well, how adv yeah. advantageous is that too, right? Like you're not waiting so long, like you're not put in the back of the line, like everything is right yeah. away. You have the employees, right? Well, that was, that was the big thing for me, like just like the earlier projects from, from a construction standpoint, mm -hmm. when I would go in, you know, and one day no one showed up. I'm firing people that day yes. and calling new people. Yes. Like, whereas, you know, other people are like, oh yeah, we had another thing come up. We'll be back on Friday. I'm like, yeah, don't come back. <laughs> right. But and I wouldn't say that, you know, I don't, I, I'm not petty because I might use them again. Once the cameras come off guys, it's the real toxic. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, you're right. And to get that level of control, I think the only way to do it is by doing it yeah. in-house. And, and that's like, you know, a decade down the line when you're doing mm -hmm. enough projects that you can really control it. But I totally get what you're saying. I like that same thing. Like a larger scale example of that is like Madame Homes right. or something like they, mm -hmm. they do their own development, their parcels, they, they build out the units themselves. And of course they subcontract yep. and then they have a crew. And from what I've heard, and this is just, you know, secondhand knowledge, I've heard people say uh, when they've bought them that they have an excellent crew that goes around and fixes deficiencies, anything that's wrong. Like they have their whole system built out. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't necessarily, I'm not saying they don't get great trades, they probably get awesome trades, but they don't necessarily need to have the best because they can have their fixers go around and just touch things up as needed. Right, right. Yeah. And it makes sense to do it that way, especially the scale that they're doing it on, right? I mean... So that's the, that's the key question for a lot of people. I think they look at it and they say, well, I've got a full-time job. I don't want to manage... I don't want to manage a, con uh, a construction site, so I'll then, hire. Then they shouldn't, right? I mean, then they shouldn't. So, you know, if you can buy the deal good enough and you can add enough value, then the margin should be big enough that you can afford to hire it out as well, right? It doesn't have to be the full-time job. Because every, yeah, everyone wants to make their profit. So what you're mm -hmm. really doing as a GC is you're taking the general contractor's profit and you're not going to be as efficient as they are. Right. So you're going to spend a bit more than they would, mm -hmm. but you're going to save that margin. And for some people, that's the difference between a deal working and not. Mm -hmm. And you know my story, obviously. So uh, for me, it was just, it was, it was either learn it myself or I didn't do it. And, yeah, yeah. And I did. Now, we, don't, we can't all be investing in Windsor where the cash flow uh, cures all <laughs> yeah. wounds, but um, it's not all property still, right? It's, it's mostly just the student rentals that um, cash flow like I mean, that? I think the cash flow is pretty attractive in, in all fronts. Like even the smaller multifamily, larger multifamily properties, the cash flow is pretty high. Now, keep in mind when we go larger multifamily, we start buying based off cap rates. So your cash flow is going to diminish, right? When you do yeah. that. But anything in the student housing market is like a ridiculous, ridiculous cash flow proposition. Like something that I've never seen before in my short 25 years on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So your, uh, your age makes, uh, I'm sure many people wish that they'd done more uh, younger, including myself. Well, uh, I mean, you can, you can say that about anyone. Like if you look at like Warren Buffett, he started at 14. That makes me pretty, feel pretty silly for starting at 17, right? So is that when you brought your first one? No, my first investment. When I, I did stocks first. 
that was at 17. My first property was only at 23. It's like a year and a half ago. So you've done a lot really quickly. Yeah, I think that's one of the benefits of not doing a JV. And this, the point of this is not to like bash on JVs because you know there's definitely different ways to do it. But like the J, doing JVs loses all your control. You know, I can pull out capital when I want to pull out capital. And if you're a good investor, you know the return should be pretty high. Do you really want to share fifty percent of that um, to to get the deal done? I, I'd prefer not to. I think that's why I've been able to scale quicker. It is a trade off. I think there there's obviously some people that it's just going to make a lot of sense for. Mm -hmm. I've obviously advocated you don't need to, but I, as I said in Kellen's episode, I really think there's an opportunity with big projects. Like if you're getting into the multi millions and you've got somebody that can come in with like a million cash and ease the burn. So say I wanted to turn over twenty units. Mm -hmm. And if I bought it myself and borrowed the money privately against my portfolio, I'm paying 12 you know, or 10% or 9% or whatever, that's going to burn so heavy that I'm eventually going to not be profitable if I right. take too long. Mm -hmm. And I like sleeping at night, so that's why I'd, it's good to sleep at uh, night. I'm not super keen <laughs> on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it, There's pros and cons to both strategies, right? I think it comes down to your personality too. Like You and I have pretty similar personalities. I think for both of us, it'd be hard to have a j joint venture in there um, just because we like the control, right? Yeah, so like I said, I'm not I'm not poo pooing it always. Um, mm -hmm. I I am specifically open to it on larger scale stuff. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just the small stuff like single houses, you know, duplex, triplex. Not really. No. No. I'd rather just take the hard money. Like mm -hmm. you know, I've had people who lend me hard money like cash, and I give them a return, and right. that that works really well. Right. And I'm going to challenge you on that a little bit because the bigger the deal gets, the more I want 100 percent of the profit yeah. because typically we're going to do better. Right. I mean. You can only make so much money doing a duplex. The reason why is because yeah. you're restricted to comparables, right? But once we do, you know, 10 units plus and we can use cap rates, now we can really start making some money there, right? So, well, sure. But again, sleeping at night, it's, it's all about right. knowing yourself, right? Like, I have, I'm not a big sleeper, so yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I've been very adamant. At, you know, I made so many mistakes in my 20s that I, I had to really come to terms with who I am and how I am. Like, and that's what I try and be very consistent with. I say no more than I say yes to opportunities. I, I'm very mm -hmm. careful about what I take on because I want it to fit with me and my personality. So yes, generally speaking, very conservative about getting in, into a deal with a JV partner. But I look at personality. I'll look at that. Like a um, good friend of mine, we partnered on many, many deals, like flips more in a company. Right. But it worked out really well. See, flips I'd be more into because I mean, it's a short term, um, yeah. short term proposition. It's a long term that, that kind of... It is because, yeah, like you said, there is the challenge with okay, I want to refinance because I have an opportunity here, right. which I don't necessarily want you, Mr. Joint Venture Partner, for that opportunity. And then you have to work that out. So it's, uh, again, yeah, it, it can work. It's just a very, very, uh, everyone needs to be on the same page as to how you're going to do it. Because right. you could write that into your contract. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some lawyers out there that do so many JV contracts that they've got all the terms just queued right up. And Right. The one thing too that gets scary though with the JVs is I find a lot of people spend more of their time practicing raising capital and raising JV partners instead of like improving their investment skills too, right? So that's like a scary, if, if like a beginner is listening to this right now, I would almost recommend doing a deal just with 100% ownership in it and working on improving your skills of adding value because you're going to find out if you can't add enough value, your capital is not going to last very, very long, right? So it kind of forces you to adapt and get better. Um, so, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting way to start, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So yeah, if you're burning money, you got to be real efficient. You got to be real efficient, right? What better, what better way to learn than when you're stretching each dollar, right? Whereas with JV, it's not even your own capital. Maybe you're cutting corners. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, different way to look at it. For sure. So you are in Windsor for how long now? Um, I moved there in July of last year. So a little over a year now, year and a half. Man, you moved fast. Right. And how, yeah. how did you get all these mortgages being self-employed as you are as a realtor? My mom. So my mom co-signs. She's never given me a dollar, but luckily she's willing to co-sign for me. Um, so all every property I own, my mom's on title. Uh, we always joke around with it because now she's a real estate mogul. Uh, she owns all these properties. But um, yeah, so my mom co-signed me. Do you put her on for like 1% ownership or, or is she? A I, she just co-signs on it. So like when we do the taxes. Okay, so the banks don't, don't make her go on title. So she's not she on does title. go on title. Yeah. Yeah. She, so do you know the percentage she goes on title or I'm not too sure. So like the way we do it with the taxes, for example, is everything just goes under my name. And like, right, so, so I she sold, doesn't get anything. Right. Yeah. I sold one of my properties too. And all of it went under me and yeah. the way we do the rental income. So yeah, that makes she sense. pretty much has the worst trade deal 
of all time. She gets no benefit and just a ridiculous amount of risk. So what are moms for? That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. Yeah. So everybody you know, kind of needed an advantage when you're getting started, mm-hmm. right? Like as a realtor, and I think you're doing quite well as a realtor. I know that you're, mm-hmm. you're okay. brand out there. Mm-hmm. You, you seem to brand yourself very well. You have a YouTube channel as well, don't you? I do. Yes. Yeah. You've been sharing some videos of your properties as well. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously with time, now you'll be in a position where that that is enough to get you all the mortgages you need. You just got to get that to your track record. Right. Well, I mean, at that point, it's probably not going to matter because I mean, the next- You'll d- own the world at that point. So it won't well, <laughs> not that far, but I, I already do own the land where I'm planning on doing the next development and that one will exceed eight units, which means that I can now do it off cap rates and I can go commercial lending. So ideally at that point, I mean, I'm not going to be buying, you know, single family homes and duplexes forever. So by the time the mortgage works with my income, I, I probably won't even be doing yeah. it that way anyway. So what we've been working on um we we were talking originally about well a couple of things we <laughs> we flopped around using yes. your ideas of what you wanted to uh to do yep. uh so most recently it is a new construction duplex right is that still the plan yes yeah so it's funny that you say that because i do shift around a lot because it's just for me it's like a state of emergency to get to the next level right so if something's taking too long or there's too much pushback. I'm just going to ditch it and move to the next thing that will push me forward. Seeking the path of least resistance? Not necessarily. It's seeking the path that's going to let me do step number three, right? So right. whenever you do one thing right now, it's to allow me to do step number three, right? So whichever mm-hmm. way I get there, I'm open to, but uh, that's why I shift a lot. So yeah, right now, what we did was we're severing the lot. So I bought a double lot. Mm-hmm. The property's right on the property line, which okay. they used to be able to build right on the property line on this street. So I have just a full vacant lot just with a detached garage on it, tear down the detached garage and then build a uh, student housing duplex. Okay. So let's talk about what the steps have been on this plan. Right. We won't go through the other ones we tried. Let's not. Um, yeah. So on this <laughs> specific plan, um, you saw the opportunity. Mm-hmm. We had already sort of talked about initiating the survey. So you have a survey. Right. Um, you've worked with a designer. Mm-hmm. All all drawings are done, even the exterior drawings now. Uh, I haven't so sent ele- them to yeah, you yet. Yeah, you haven't sent them to me. Yeah, okay. yeah, just got so them a couple of days ago. So you got elevations done. Um, mm-hmm. You can see what the outside looks like. And then yeah. I th- one of the first things we were we were working on is a functional layout. Right. And tell you know talk about some of the specific issues you were having with your designer. Not mm-hmm. not trying to diminish Knock or anything. On the designer or anything. Yeah, yeah yep. but yep. just some of the the challenges because other people are probably going to experience this too. Yeah, just I guess my biggest piece of advice right away before we even get started is just remember that you're the one steering the ship, right? So if, if your designer does something that you don't like, just make sure that you take control of it and, and get what you want done. So the issue that we had originally with the architect is they just wanted to do like all bedroom windows to the front and back of the building, even though there was nothing in the building code or anything stating that. He just had this impression that that was necessary. So he didn't want bedrooms on the sides. He didn't want bedrooms on the sides. And I wanted only bedrooms on the side. So it was conflicting. So pretty much what happened was he sent me the drawings and I stayed up to like four in the morning and just did the drawings myself, went to his office the next day and said, draw this. And that's what happened. And and I've done the same thing. Like Mm -hmm. you you have to know the rules, right? Like, okay, well, wait a minute. Why are you doing it that way? Because If you had settled for the design mm-hmm. he sent you, it would have been drastically inferior and you wouldn't, sure. it would have just not been uh, the best possible product you could have mm-hmm. had. Yeah. So by pushing back, so now we've got this model where you've got all the pro- uh, bedrooms on one side and let's hope, let's hope that the municipality doesn't give any trouble on that. Well, I called you first to see like if, if you've ever heard of this because it didn't make any sense to me. And then I also called the city, the person that I'm working with in the city and they're like, I don't see why that would be an issue. And I'm yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. So I've done that multiple times where mm-hmm. I did, I've done a hallway on one side and then just bedrooms all down the other side. Just makes sense. It's the most efficient design. It I is. mean, it's not attractive maybe for a homeowner mm-hmm. as attractive. It's still fine. Yeah. But this is student housing, like in you Waterloo. You know what it is. Yeah. yeah. The Waterloo, the way we built it too, is when you walk into the apartment, you have a big open living room kitchen. And then a hallway yeah. of bedrooms, right? Like that's just the way yeah. to do it. Space efficiency. For purpose built student rentals, there are worse things. Yeah. Like I've, I know in London, some of the first purpose built student rentals I said, ha- saw had hallway down the middle, bedrooms on either side, all the way down in the kitchen and living room at the very front. Oh yeah. You know, it's just very, and that's a pretty common layout. Mm-hmm. You've probably Extremely seen common. That. Yeah. We've yeah. done a few of those. What other challenges have you had so far on that one? I, I guess the, the, the more of the challenges were, were up dealing, front. Dealing with the city um, was the biggest challenge. And if anyone from the city of Windsor is listening, you guys do a great job. No, um, it, it was a little bit challenging because it's COVID too. So everything's a little bit slower. So one, you couldn't go into the city. Um, two, you couldn't get anyone on the phone. So it's only done through emails where the average response time is five days. Mm-hmm. So being a first time developer, not really knowing what's going on and doing it that way. 
um, was really challenging. But now um, I had lunch with somebody and now we're getting replies pretty quickly and we're on the phone pretty much daily. So yeah, it'd be probably pretty helpful to take them up for golf if they golf. Or, I don't right. Think, can yeah. they accept that? And like, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, it was a friend of a friend connection. So we went for lunch and uh, it's yeah. helped me tremendously. So and now I get responses yeah. really quick. Yeah. Okay. So I know we were talking about on this specific lot, we were talking mm-hmm. about trying to do, wasn't it a fourplex it was going to be? Right. So originally we're going to use both lots. So we, so right now we're keeping the existing house and yeah. building something else. So technically it's three units instead of yeah. four. So we are missing out on one unit. But, but yeah, we not were gonna, tearing down a house is more profitable, I would think. Oh, the, yeah. the profit margins now are, yeah, I'm making almost, yeah, it, the profit's good. Okay. So let's, let's isolate the value of that lot let's do so the, the lot that you're severing yeah so the lot's probably worth around anywhere from 100 to 125,000. okay but you in terms of cost mm-hmm. what are you gonna like let's just just assume the house that you already bought it already cash flowed it, it was does. good yeah tremendously. so what uh what's it gonna cost you to sever do you figure so like the whole severance process yeah, so or like, all of the soft costs well you know what i'm gonna should i include my sunk cost of because i paid for the rezoning and then pulled out or do we just forget about that? Uh, we, let's just ignore that because okay. that, that's a different... Right. I mean, we could look at it. What was that? That was like five grand? 5,500. Yeah, which is ironically enough, pretty much the same cost that it's going to be to sever the lot, right? Okay. So you're looking at... So basically, including sunk costs, you're about 11,000, you right. figure? But let's keep that out because I'm still in negotiations. I am trying to get that back. So Okay. So 5,500 then in soft costs. Right. Let's do that. It's well, plus your to. survey though. Right. Well, the survey was about $1,200 to $1,500, I think. That's it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wow, you found a cheap surveyor. Yeah. Okay, so we'll call it $7,000 then is your soft costs to sever that lot. So that's really the cost of that lot. Mm-hmm. because And it wasn't like you were burning money while you're doing it because the other ca- property is cash flowing the whole time. Yeah, 1300 a month. 1300 a month, yes. Man, Windsor's great. My best, most cash flowing property cash flows that. <laughs> <laughs> and that property is worth a million dollars. Like just short of a this, million This bucks. property is worth a quarter million dollars. <laughs> So that's the difference there, uh, yeah. London to Windsor. Um, anyway, okay, so you're seven thousand dollars in. Uh, then to build, what are we thinking? Have you crunched those numbers yet? Yeah. So let's do around like, do you want to do like one eighty a square, or do you want to push it up to two hundred? You know, the lumber cost went down a little bit. I've been, Did I've been it? Keeping yeah, my actually, eye on I saw it. I saw that too. Um, so let, even let's just say one ninety a square foot sure. if you end up yeah, there. Yeah, let's do one ninety uh, a square. Being conservative. Yeah, sure. Um, and how many square feet are we looking at there? So it's. Um, do you have a calculator on your Excel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 17 by 55, and then times two is two floors. Oh, I think it's like 1,800 square feet, maybe. All right, let's just see here. So 190 by 17 times 55. 55 times, times two. two floors. So, uh, yeah, 350. Um, they're going to charge you development charges, right? Or no? No, waived area. Waived. Okay, so permit fees, you might be four grand or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, what else might you have? You're gonna have some insurance. I don't know. We can. That would be in the 190. So, what about uh, connections to the road? You're gonna need to connect sanitary and water main. Well, we already have the existing because it's like each lot beside it already has houses, right? So it's not like I'm putting no, a lot in the middle. No, you just need to cut into the road. You just need to bring it to the lot line. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. you'll probably be another 20 grand doing that um, connections. So let's just say conservatively, you might be able to do it a bit cheaper. But uh, okay, so let's just sum that up. So you're going to be into and a basement. We have to finish the basement as well. So. Um, but that 190 should cover that. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I'm going to oh, make more, know, you're more throwing more. well with the kitchen. Maybe, maybe we'll just bring you up to 200 then. Sure. Yeah. So it, so it'll cover that. Let's see. Since there's a kitchen down there, change my mind. Okay, <laughs> it'll be a nice kitchen. So too. you'll be closer. You'll probably be, you know, 375 to 400 if, if you're self-managing, right. running the show. Right. Uh, I think that's very doable. So total invested into this lot and building is 405,000. Mm-hmm. Now, what kind of ARV? ARV are we looking Around at? 700,000. You think it's 700? Okay, yeah. so we'll just write this in. So you're in a position where you'll be able to pull all your money back out too. Definitely and some. Yeah, I should get almost six figure on, t- on top of the pullout because we can still do um, 20% down um, as well. It's just a duplex, right? 780%. Hopefully you can still get that. 
You may have to go 75, depending I on- I did. We, we had a meeting with my uh, mortgage broker. He seems to think that there's no reason why we would have to go to the- uh, Okay. So he thinks he can get yeah, it done with a regular A lender? extremely confident. Yeah. Yeah. So you can still get them done with A lenders. It's just some of them, it, depending if there was locks on the doors and the appraiser says, this is clearly a student house in their report, then sometimes right, they won't right. do it. Yeah. But and I'm you, never opposed. I actually enjoy having more equity in my properties. Yeah. Typically, I don't even refinance um, if I don't have to. So a new loan here would be 560, mm -hmm. which means you're going to be pulling out 155,000. Yep. Uh, so 155,000, and then you're going to cash flow. Let's let's just see how much it'll be. So, uh, what do you figure your rents are going to be? Because how many bedrooms are we talking? You're six it'll six bedrooms nine. in the main unit, and then right. three in the lower. Yeah. So six bed, three bath, upper, and then a uh, three bedroom, one bath, lower. Okay. So six uh, times. Uh, sorry, how much rent are you expecting in the? I'm expecting 675, but let's do 650 per room. Just across the whole house? Yeah, just to be more conservative, but I do think it'll be higher. I think I'll get 700 per room on the lower and 675 on the upper. 5850 gross rent. Right. Oh, that's, that's nice. Okay, so taxes, what do you figure you'll get into on something like, like that? Like the property tax yeah. is probably going to be around 5K per annum. Yeah. They will uh, assess it. Of so course. you just got to kind yeah. of see what the neighbors are paying. I, I did. I looked at uh, some other new development that did a similar thing. He was at like 40, 4,500, I think, taxes. So. Let's give an extra 500 for fun. Okay. So, so to be, be conservative, we'll say two grand in insurance. I'm sure you could do it a bit cheaper than sure. that, yep. but just, just in case mm -hmm. utilities, you're going to have, you're going to be inclusive. I do. Yeah. But I cap them as well. So what I'm thinking is it's likely going to be 350 for a hydro and water. 350 a month. Okay. And then we're probably going to do another 125 for gas between the two units. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're going to be, uh, we'll call it 475 a month then. For sure. Yeah. And then we do have to include internet as well for students. That's right. Okay. So, so that's a 150 per month on top of that. I get the that. Uh, I get the fiber optic gigabit. Just so you, they don't complain. You got to listen to your market. So that's that's yeah. good. So we said 475 plus 150 so you're going to be 625 then. Right. Yeah. I and it's I want to add to that. It's not just the market. So nobody really does that in the market. The reason I do is because I do not want to get a complaint. I don't want to ever get a phone call for anything. So I just try to get it. I totally agree with that. I you, you didn't hear about this yet, but I've been Having issues because I have my, my duplex okay. where I have water meter. It's supposed to be a 60 40 split, mm -hmm. but the tenants have like basically created a war between each other and oh, me. Oh, no. That they, don't, they think the other one's using way too much. And, and so now I'm doing private metering. So I, I agree with paying to eliminate headaches. Like of this course. is just, yeah. especially as you scale, silliness. Right? Silliness. Yeah. Um, okay. So lawn cutting and snow removal. I, I do it myself, but I mean, if you just want to put in a, 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 a number for it, yeah, 100 a month if you want. I, I like a, like, Across the year, probably that you might be able to get a little cheaper in winter, even just say a thousand. Well, especially because I have um, multiple lots as well, right? So if I did end up outsourcing it, they would do all five lots and then it would probably be a reduced rate. Especially but, if they're close. Well, actually, I was getting, I think it was 125 a month that I got the quote for, but then uh, my dad actually cuts all my lawns. I don't do it myself. <laughs> um, so you put in whatever, whatever That's you feel awesome, comfortable okay, with. I'm just going to put it if, if we were some random person doing it. Right. So um, management, I'm not going to put anything there. I know you manage mm -hmm. yourself. Um, I'm a big advocate for that, but I will put in just 500 miscellaneous sure. uh, costs that you may have throughout the year. So you're a 7.24% cap rate on that. Mm -hmm. For a new development. On a new development. And then what do you figure, I mean, interest rates have been good. What do you think you're going to be getting at? It's probably going to be low twos. Yeah. Let's just say 2.5. Sure. We don't know what will happen over the next year. Um, do you know when we're going to be like, when are you going to be seeing a building permit for that? Do you figure? Well, so with the communication with the city, they say there's no reason I shouldn't be able to start by February, which is the goal. Nice. So I can finish for September. So that's very, very soon. Okay. Right. So we're filming this in November. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So 2000 bucks a month cash flow on that. Right. So something which is that's not even, pay which you. doesn't even get me that excited to be, <laughs> to be frank with you, just because the fourplex offered much more cash flow, but we need to do this to be able to build for next year. So. This is something you can re-leverage. You're talking about pulling out $155,000 and that's included. So that money now is, is more or less free, if you want to think of it that way. Right. Because the interest is being paid for by that house. Mm -hmm. So as yep. long as you can keep that thing fully occupied. Which, yeah, for sure it will be as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, you seem to know your market pretty well and what, what they want. Like, I know we've talked a lot about make it special, make it stand out. Mm -hmm. Because that way, when other people, if the market changes, you will stand out and continue to rent, right. even if others don't. So in Windsor, the, the people I compete with, the purpose-built housing, I don't know what they're thinking, but when they build these new properties, they do ugly tile flooring, like yeah. just regular counter. It just doesn't look good. So, And they're charging six fifty a room. That's why I'm saying I'm pretty yeah. confident I'll get higher. I'm going to do like white marble, kind of the way you do your properties. Yeah. 
Um, so it'll definitely stand out. Uh, and it's about 700 meters from the university as well. So that's amazing. Which is yeah. my farthest, furthest property from the 700 university. 700 meters. So everybody's walking. No yeah. one has to bus. Well, no, no yeah. bus. That's actually quite amazing. Like in Western, that's not reasonable. Like the campus mm -hmm. is just so big. Like you right. bus from one end to the other. Yeah. Different, different markets are like that. When we were in Kingston as well, building uh, the Sage Kingston project, and you had to be like, you know, like yeah. a kilometer and a half away. So actually outside of that though, all of my properties are within two streets from the university. I have house that's five houses away. That's usually yeah. what I try to do. But is um, the campus pretty centralized? Yes. So extremely. it's all like in one spot. Very dense. You do have other like smaller campuses on the outside, but you always want to be close to the main campus. The that's, main building. That's yeah. where the most population is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why Western's done what they've done. Like there's just well, like it's a huge, it's huge. Campus. From the east end to the west end, it's like a mm -hmm. kilometer and a half probably. And well, then the they've student got the population though is what, like 30,000 Western? Oop. Yeah. I think it's even more than that. Um, right. It was 30,000 when I went there and that was a while ago. You know, a couple of years anyway. It's almost twice, twice the size. So yeah, campus spread out. Huge opportunity there in Windsor, though. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, it's got the law school. Do they have a med school there too? No, they don't have no med school. No, so no. it's got law school, obviously engineering. So they, they do have a a joint program. They go across the border, which is the hugest. Oh yeah, hugest the, the joint law to Detroit Mercy. Exactly. Yeah. My friend was uh, was in that program. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So just looking at your your return here. So annual pay down on that mortgage could be thirteen thousand six hundred. Uh, appreciation if you got three percent would be 21,000. I know everywhere has been doing better than that, but I don't like mm -hmm. to bank on it. Yeah. And uh, cash flow, 24,000 a year. So that's 58,000 a year on something you'll have nothing into. Uh, even if you were to buy it at a 20% down payment, you'd have 38% return on investment. Right. And I always look at return on equity, always, always, always. So yeah, which initially is the same return ROE right. and ROI are well, the same. After, initially. After the so, so yeah, that then mm -hmm. there you go. So mm -hmm. then you're, you're going to be at an ROE of almost 40%. Right. And I always look at the ROE. It's super important to me because if the ROE is, ROE is lower than what kind of hits my threshold, then yeah. I don't want to hold the asset. Right. Right. So for those who aren't familiar with that, um, just think of it like this. If, if you've owned your property for a long time and you only paid, you know, 5% down, like 20 grand for it, but now it's got $500,000 in equity, you want to find a way to calculate a return on that $500,000 in equity right. uh, to figure out if you're efficient, because the idea is you could technically refinance to 20% equity. And now all of a sudden when you're calculating return, it's numerator over denominator. If the denominator is smaller, you have a higher return. Right. So that's and, that, what, and then you redeploy that capital, the extra money you pull out elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is if you're getting an optimal ROE uh, on every property, you're going to make more money overall. Right. You, ROE always has to be you know, the front runner of your decision making. So, and, and if you're going to sell it, make sure to take it one step further. What are you going to pay in taxes and include that into your ROE? Because um, unfortunately, the taxes are high in this country. They're really yeah. high. So, you know, and that's a big that's a big hurt, right? Because it you know up front, if you're at the top tax tax bracket uh, and you sell, then you're mm -hmm. going to be looking at you know paying paying twenty five percent on your gain. Yeah, that's why I don't do flips because flips are taxed at your income rate, and you know if you're an above fifty percent income tax bracket, it just really digs into the returns, right? Well, I just launched the episode with Cherry, and obviously there's you know I'm not a, not an accountant, so talk to your accountant. But I read her book. Oh, you did? Okay, nice. I have not read it. Uh, but fifty, I'm I'm at like a thirteen percent on my active corporation. So if I flip a property in my active corporation, it's just 13. I think it's 13. I'm liking, I'm liking you less and less as this uh, podcast goes on. <laughs> you would be too. So you just have to incorporate. Oh, ah, okay. So active versus passive. And again, everyone always talk to your accountant. But my, my scenario is that my active income is very low tax. And then my passive, my rental income is like 50% tax, right. which is insane. Then depreciation. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's my saving grace is that I can do the, what's called the capital cost allowance. Mm -hmm. And I basically have them so far the first two years in my corp for like holding just a passive property. Uh, I've, I haven't paid tax on it. So, and I will keep doing that because mm -hmm. to me, time value money, dollar today is worth more to yes. me than a dollar, you know, five years from now or whatever. When you sell, exactly. See, yep. An account will always, you know, many accounts will tell you, well, no, don't you want to wait to to do the co capital cost allowance until you're making more money or Mine something like that. Mine did the first year and I said, no, you're putting it in right now. Like uh, that's hundred percent happening. Yeah. I mean, it's, everyone's going to have their own scenario. For me, I don't like that. I want right. that. I don't want to pay that tax. Like if my, if my accountant says, oh, you could pay 20 grand more tax or we can write down your properties. I'm saying write down my properties. Of course. Yeah. You're an investor that your capital are your tools. That's your, that's your tool yeah, belt, right? So you that. need to have your tools. Well, and if your tools are getting you 38%, like by having that money now, think about what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? So 
you're able to re redeploy that. Maybe this do is an a extra quick. Deal. This is a quick development. I don't want that to reflect the numbers of the student housing development in Windsor. The numbers are much better than that on the bigger scale projects. Um, better than I. So you're saying the cap rate is higher than seven point two four percent? Well, not after you refinance it, but then at that point you'll be able to refinance based off the cap rate. So the the biggest trap in Windsor is the low housing prices. So when I do a deal like this, I should not be refinancing at a seven cap for a brand new development, right? Whereas when we build multiple units, now it's a multifamily property, we use the cap right now, I'm revaluing at the true value of the property. So my refinance is going to be much higher. The cash flow will take a hit. So the ROE will be lower because of that, right? But when we do like little single family student rentals or duplexes, we're, we're capped at the comparable properties. That's why the right. ARV is so low, right? This should so not you're be just, a 700. You're just saying, yeah, you're just saying they're looking at comparable properties, duplexes, and you're just getting a duplex comparable. And I agree with you. You once you get into using an appraiser that that is has the AACI designation, they do that what's called a long narrative appraisal, and then you're like you're into a hundred a hundred page appraisal report. Right, those ones cost like twenty five hundred, three thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. But those are the type of appraisals they'll do on a sixplex or or higher. And mm -hmm. now you're dealing with commercial lending, and commercial lending is willing to lend based. They'll do their own internal valuation with a cap rate. They'll calculate your debt coverage ratio. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they absolutely might value you at a four cap, if that makes sense for your market. I doubt it does there. Probably a five cap yeah. is what it would be, but definitely not a seven. Like that's ridiculous yeah. to see, right? But I'm not complaining because well, I still get- Well, you're doing well, yeah. Right, the, the numbers are fine, but that is why uh, you, know, you want to go into more units well, as quick as you can. This is right up the alley of the, the episode I did a, a little while back with Charles Waugh talking about infill development, because that's really mm -hmm. what you're doing. You're, you're taking a lot that's there, um, that's not technically severed now, but you're going to sever it. Um, any idea why they set it up that way? Why they put the house onto one side and then you just had this big open space on the other? I don't know, but I would love to thank the person who did it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the reasoning was. They were really awesome it. for doing that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Do you think it was a previously a separate lot or in merged well, or no? Well, on the survey, it's, uh, it's two lots, but I can't find anything through the city where it was severed. Like two part lots? Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. So it's like lot 31, lot 30 on the, on the survey. Interesting. There might already, maybe there was at one point a house built there. Right. It, you know, it could have been. Who knows? And then they tore it yeah. down and it just merged with the other one. So yeah, who knows? Yeah, that works out really well for you. Okay. So that one looks like a pretty fantastic deal. Yep. You've got yourself yeah. a, an extra lot. You just mm -hmm. bought another one. I did. What'd you buy? So duplex conversion. I couldn't help myself because we thought we were going to do the fourplex. So I have this extra capital save that yeah. I was going to spend on that. So I thought, you know what? This property is something I can do a duplex conversion on. So the listing agent didn't even put that the zoning supports a duplex for it. Um, they just put residential. So I looked through the city, found that it supports a duplex, and it's five houses away from the main campus of the University of Windsor. Really expensive neighborhood. So you're going to uh, do a basement unit on this? Yeah. The basement is 1,800 square feet. No way. Unfinished. How is that even feet possible? Ceilings. So the building, the, the structure is 30 by 60, I believe. Wow, that's massive. It is the biggest basement I have ever seen. And in the video, I took a video tour of it the first time. And in the video, as soon as I walk, down in Serbia, and I was like, I'm buying this immediately. <laughs> like, there's no way I'm not buying this. And what did that cost you? So, I, I, I spent a lot on this one. Um, I spent $340,000 acquisition. That's really not that much for how big that is. No kidding, right? So, the upstairs, the main floor unit is already a three bedroom, one bath as, okay. it, as it stands right now. It doesn't really need any renovations, but I'll probably spruce it up a little bit. Paint three trim. bed, one bath with 1,800 square feet. Yes. It feels like you, you could add bad, bad bedrooms. The layout, the layout just doesn't really allow it. Doesn't really, okay. Yeah, yeah it doesn't allow yeah. it. It's a massive, oversized three-bedroom, one-bath. And you know what? I'm okay with that because the cash flow on this will be the same as the cash flow on the duplex, 2000 a month, roughly. 2000 a month. Yeah, at the end. And That's it should all right. be all money out or maybe $10,000 left in the deal. What do you figure in your, I know, is 1800 is a lot to finish. Are you planning on finishing all that? Yeah, I am. So that it's going to be pretty expensive. I think it's probably going to be close to $100,000. I'm thinking 75 to 100000 Yeah, probably close to one hundred. Yeah, the first contractor I, I had that gave me a quote for, a contractor as well, not, not doing subtrades, was 75000 yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the nice thing with contractors for that is they probably do a lot of them. It's, right. it's not that complex mm -hmm. of a reno. So that and one- I, I might actually use a contractor for this one because I'm going to be building the, yeah. the other one at the same time. Right. And, and by no means do I mean to demonize contractors mm -hmm. in any way. I would, I would use them in certain circumstances, of right. course, right? It's just a matter of personal preference, I think is the main thing. And yep. then if you yeah. have the time, you know, learning, it's a skill to be able to do it. So mm -hmm. if you, let's just say you were a hundred with carrying costs. Sure. Let's do it. Uh, so if you were a hundred on that, then you're going to be 440 all in. Yes. 
And what do you think you are going to be worth at the end of that? The ARV, when I talked to the appraiser about it, was around 550, which I really think it's worth a lot more than that. But let's use what the appraiser says at 550. Okay, so 550, and let's just assume we're going to still get that 80% until you tap out. Mm -hmm. So on that 550 times 0.8, you're making this seem fun. <laughs> what, the uh, Windsor market? Yeah, just like. It's like I'm monopoly. So much everything, everything just pays like crazy. So you, it looks like you'll be in for zero. It looks like you're going to get a new mortgage at 440. You're yeah, in for 440. And you know what? I'm budgeting that it's going to cost me like a little bit more than that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Some, something's going to happen because this isn't a brand new development. So like I'm going to run into something yeah. for sure. Okay. So then that one, you're going to have how many bedrooms in total? So the upstairs is going to remain a three bedroom, one bath, but it yeah. is going to be the sweetest three bedroom, one You're bath. You're going to get more than Windsor, 650. And on it's that, five yeah. houses away from the main campus. Yeah. Very expensive neighborhood. So that one's going to be what? 700, do you think? 750 per room, minimum. 750 times three. And then we're going to add how many in the basement? So this one will be 700 per room as well in the basement. It's going to be a four bed, two bath. Okay. Why not go more? You have more space. Monaco, we'll, have five bedrooms. we'll have to see the way it, when, when i drew the the drawings really quick i could only make it fit four bedroom two bath keeping a good size layer because of the way the, the layout is you try to do all the what, what's in well, the we'll layout talk. that's stopping we'll, you we'll discuss we'll it we'll, we'll discuss talk. it after we could talk now <laughs> yeah there's these huge posts um, oh, columns the coming basement. down exactly you can you can reroute them sometimes depending yeah. on there, structural things can change, right? You can put mm -hmm. beams in, you can transfer loads down, but you'll often have to um, smash up your floor and pour new uh, pads to, right. to transfer those loads down. So, mm -hmm. um, which isn't that hard to do and that expensive. Ductwork can be rerouted, but yeah, that that'd be a good one if you have a video of it. We can. I do. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it after, but maybe we can. Let's let's say it's going to stay four bedrooms. Say okay, so, so stay four. But if yeah, we can get so, five, you know me, I'm gonna. If I can get a fifth bedroom in there, it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. That's why I was surprised because you definitely seem <laughs> eager to cram as many bedrooms into yeah. every house yeah, as you can. To, to, to a limit, you know, I think after this, this next one, that's going to be my last six bedroom units. I think I will start doing one and two bedroom units uh, for the student housing. One and two? Yes, I think I will. Wow. That's yeah. like, I but feel it, like you're better off just renting to families on a one bed. Like, well, if you look at it, um, the rent per square foot when you're building, depending on if the city restricts you on the amount of units, sometimes they'll switch and restrict you on the amount of bedrooms. Depends on what the city does, but we, we made that shift in Waterloo as well. We went from five bedrooms to one and twos, and the rental income per square foot increased. Really? Yeah. Depends how you design it. That, that's curious to me because, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the big costs in your units, your bathrooms, and your kitchens, right? right. Your bedrooms yeah. don't cost you that much. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing that many more kitchens, like well, a kitchen per student, then that is all, all of a sudden that's driving your cost. Well, let's think about it. If you can do a 500 square foot one bedroom unit, you know, you can jam a whole lot of those in and you can get, let's say, 1400 per month rental income for that 500 square so feet. Can you get 1400 from a student? I think so. If I do a luxury. So there's another, I ha there's this uh, girl that goes to law school. She took a one bedroom and immediately I'm like, I'm like I need to go see your unit. It's close to the university. I need to know how much you're paying. Um, and she was doing 1200 per month plus hydro there. And it was a dump carpet, everything. Um, so if we do a brand new luxury yeah. unit, I think we can do 14. I like, I really like the luxury market. That's, yep. I, I mean, there are risks with that, like anything, mm -hmm. but I, I'm a big fan of it. So on that one, um, assuming you're taking a permit, they're going to reassess your taxes. What do you figure you're going to be at? Yeah, it's going to be pr probably pretty much the same as the other one. Yeah, I, th I think so. And then insurance, you might, yeah, your footprint's actually going to make your insurance higher there. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like 2,500 probably. Um, I hope you're less, but uh, just I think it's less as well, but let's be um, conservative. Okay, so utilities, they're similar? Same, similar, yeah. So, yeah, so, so like 7,500 a year and right. then uh, lawn cutting, I'm still going to throw that thousand in. Sure. Well, this one doesn't really have much, well, it's still throw no. it in, still throw it in. All right. We, somebody's got to cut it. I mean, I, I haven't yet, and I know I've had people, I've, I've put this challenge out there and I've had people re reach out to me, mm -hmm. find somebody who's reliable, who will cut my lawns um, and, and clear my snow for less than a hundred a month, averaging across the year. So that's in London. Now I know I just talked to Kellen and he has somebody doing it for like peanuts, like 30 or 40 or whatever. Um, for, 40, 40 per month is what I would expect in Windsor. I've, I've gotten multiple wow. quotes. Okay. At, at so, that so point. that sounds awesome. I'd love that. Now in fairness, like my guy does fall clean up and cleans up my eaves troughs too right. and stuff that's included in that. So, um, I'm not a, I'm not a believer in trees around the properties if they don't oh, need well, to Well, I'm not there. either, but, yeah. but uh, I know some people are going to be like, we need more trees, but come on. I don't want to rake those things. Nature thought differently and, and grew them next to my houses. So, that's right. Yeah. Um, it, my, my property is pretty much across the board 
like the eavesdrops just fill up and the problem with that is now you get water pouring over the edge of the eavesdrops yep. next to the foundation and then you get water in the basement so mm -hmm. that's one of the most important pieces of maintenance a person could do on a property yeah even better is to buy a house with no trees around it Right. Well, especially when you go into winter and that water coming down the eavesdrop starts to freeze and oh, yeah. now you're getting all sorts it of can damage. Be a hits real someone's head, maybe, right? So break yeah. your eavesdrops right off if they fill up. They, they fill a block of ice and then mm -hmm. they just start breaking off, hanging off. So, anyways, side tangent. Um, <laughs> you, uh, what do you figure that's worth? 700 again? Or no, you were saying 550, right? Yeah, five. And again, that's, I really do think it's going to be worth more than that, but I don't want to, okay. to say a number that doesn't end up being say true. Say you're in with zero, 30 year amortization on an 80% mortgage. You've got instant equity in there of, uh, of 110,000. You're, you're getting 1,680 in cash flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, at that point, like these cash flow numbers are insane. Like, <laughs> Why yeah, you just retire? Like what? <laughs> well, I'll never retire because no, I love I know. what it's I do. It's just fun, right? But it's just fun. See, you yeah. know what? I actually, when I first started doing the YouTube, I said retired at 23. And I actually wasn't working for a while. I was just living off the cash flow. But I changed it to financially uh, free now because I'm totally yeah. not retired. Well, the, the benefit I see is just choosing each day. Like I don't yes. like doing nothing. I like I like taking on a challenge. Yeah. So that's that's the key. Like I, I'm like mm -hmm. I said, I say no a lot more than I say yes. Yeah, but how nice of a feeling is it knowing that if you wanted to go live in Hawaii for two years, you can do it. Yeah, you can do it, and you're gonna be making quite a yeah. bit of money. You know, still Absolutely. making pretty good money. Well, you're making me like consider that market. Although I, I'm I'm pretty heavy into student stuff already, so yeah. I, I just I'd like to diversify a bit out of that, mm -hmm. um, just in case something were to happen in the student market. Right. Of course, we've talked about this. Windsor, I like I like the infrastructure that's there in that town. Industry-wise, it's not quite as diverse as there, some other towns. Over thirty percent of GDP is in the auto industry. Auto, yeah. Still. So. Which is great. I mean, it, and, and, and that's actually not too much either because there are other industries there too. You've got education, which is nice. And then of course, you've got all the, the businesses that come in just to serve the people. So right. I think there's always going to be a market for Windsor. I don't know if I see a, a, a change that would come that would, that would you know, take people away unnecessarily, but who knows? Like it happened in Alberta, but even, even in Alberta, they're they haven't dropped like a rock. Like they, right. they've actually well, the stayed pretty thing, steady. The one thing that could have happened is if when they transitioned to electric vehicles, if Windsor didn't get the contracts to do those electrical vehicle production, that probably could have stopped them in like a 10, 15 year time period. It could have turned into like a Sarnia, but fortunately they did get the contract and yeah. they're probably going to be the capital for building EVs. So it'll be good for them. Windsor has been getting better and better over time. Like yes. I remember 10 years ago, no one, no one wanted to go to Windsor and then it got turned into such a hot real estate you know what market. I hate about that though yeah. the way I invest in stocks and everything and I still invest in stocks too but the way I invest is usually when people don't want to buy things that's when I get really excited that's why I came to Windsor originally as well I don't like that everybody likes it so much oh yeah it kind of ruins the fun it does because then everybody comes in there and they steal steal your uh, your opportunity you could close your eyes and throw a baseball and hit a student house three years ago and you, you would have made tons of money right um, that's usually what happens when people are not buying those assets but now as it gets more popular you know those those returns yeah. diminish of course when they do come are you able to help them as a realtor of course absolutely yeah what, what are you like who are you t typically helping as so a realtor? student housing right now i'm trying to encourage everybody please take advantage of this small period of time that we have in history where the universities are closed because once they open back up the numbers that we have right now people are going to be buying it just like they were before covid like i think yeah. it was the hottest submarket in all of canada so if you can buy student housing now if you have a short-term risk tolerance um, and then i do small to medium-sized multifamily as well as is my specialty. Okay. So those, yeah. most people are, are investors that are working with you. I, yeah, exclusively work with investors. If you want to buy your dream house, I'm not the guy. I don't really get super excited about that. But if you want to make some money, I'm definitely here to help you. I like that. I think, I think being in a niche in any business is mm -hmm. so much better than being just, hey, I serve everybody. Well, just enjoy what you do. I, like, yeah. I, I just don't get a, a thrill out of walking through and you know, liking certain accent walls and stuff. I like talking numbers. And if the numbers yeah. work, I get excited too. So it's a lot of fun. I do like the creative side of it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I love creating the nice product and then also profiting. Those are cool. Yes. It, you know what? Be, that's one of my favorite parts about being a developer soon to become a developer is like no other business can you like think of something, imagine something in your mind and then actually make it come true. Right. And every time you drive by that street, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I built that. Some of the most fun is just like going to see the properties while they're being renovated. I, I, yeah. I like thoroughly enjoy that. That's like a happy place for me. Uh, my wife always says I'm happier when I'm doing, doing a, a project right, yeah. for myself, like doing the big builds, like it, it becomes more project management mm -hmm. uh, and less, less of an adventure, yeah. um, especially because I've done it a lot and you know, it's, just, it's less new. 
But uh, I love I love the uniqueness of a new project. Okay, sure. well, we've got these beams in the way, these columns in the way. Mm-hmm. How are we going to make this work? And the creative element of of like seeing it from start to finish, like this layout didn't work, and I worked with the designer to make it work, just like you're doing right, right. now. No, you tell the designer, no, this mm-hmm. is what I want, and then you see it come to life. When you see that finished, that's weirdly satisfying. Of course. Well, it's an intellectual challenge too, right? Which is why I think maybe both of us like it too. It's not like an easy thing per se, right? You know, yeah. creativity, intelligence really comes into play when it comes to development. Like even when we were in Waterloo and I worked for the developer, my mom would come visit. I would walk her through and point at all of them. We built this one. Like, you know, yeah. we built this. We're going to build this here. It was so exciting. Because that's something we haven't gotten into yet. You, mm-hmm. you kind of had an angle on this. Give, give the backstory. Like you, you, you worked in the industry. Right. Yeah. So when I was 17 and, and I went to Windsor, I come from a really small town of a thousand people and I saw a crane. And I'm like, what, what's going on there? Like what's going on with the crane? And, and I saw that they were building an apartment building happened to be student housing. Um, so I went to the guy, the guy that was building, his name was Alberto. I told him, I'm like, listen, man, like I'll do whatever you want. I'll clean your floors, whatever. I'll work for free. Just let me be around you. You don't even have to mentor me. Just let me yeah. be around you. I want to see how this works. And it was love at first sight, uh, seeing the construction. So I knew right then, that moment that that's what I was going to do. Um, so then from there, for the next five years, the whole time I was in university, I got a degree, but the main thing was learning how the student housing development business works. And did you get your degree in Windsor? I did. In Waterloo. Oh, this in is Waterloo. all in Waterloo. Okay, so you did it right. in Waterloo. Yes. Uh, yeah, which is, was a, a hot student market for a long time. Well, it's the, I, yeah. I consider it the student housing capital of Canada because I think even right now, if you want to fact check on it, but the statistics, I think it's like 70% of purpose-built student housing is in Waterloo, Ontario wow. for Canada. Like seventy percent of all Canada's purpose built student purpose built student housing. Yeah, because they had a lot of the high rises, right? They had or well, mid rises. They, they started yeah. the trend. Like Canada's, yeah. you know, decades behind the United States and England and other countries for student housing. That's why we're seeing yeah. this incredible amount of development going around every city now. Even in yeah. Windsor, you're seeing student housing development. So, yeah, it's well, they they kind of got a little bit hurt, right? They, for a while there, everybody was going after it, and then uh, the cap rates started to rise a bit. The values mm-hmm. went down a little bit. Um, Maybe they hit a point of saturation. What's your take on that? What happened in, in Waterloo? Whereabouts? In Waterloo, people are still building. Um, yeah, they're still know, building. The, the smart pioneers that started the development there are no longer building in, water, in Waterloo. They've moved, they've moved right. out. Right. Now the new guys that, you know, the gold rush people is what I like to call them. You always have these people with capital that come in. Yeah. Well, everybody's making money, so I want to do it. But the pioneers now have moved on to Hamilton, Kingston. Um, and Niagara is another place where they're doing some building right now. So I, I keep yeah. uh, I keep close tabs to what they're doing. It's good to know that. Like I know a guy who who actually not in the student stuff, but he was buying um, 100 unit apartment buildings in Windsor. He did that for a while. Then he eventually decided, okay, these numbers aren't as good for me. Then he moved to Sarnia, and then he moved across the border into the United States and just started yeah. picking his markets. And um, you know, it being able to adjust to your market, watch it is important. It's, uh, it's been a hard thing for me watching London and, mm-hmm. and just being frustrated with it because of the price change. But uh, we all need to pivot. You know, we all yeah. need to be able to, to re- regroup if, if we don't like the opportunities we're seeing. Uh, we either niche down and find a specific angle on things or we find a new market. Well, I wanted to go to London. So when, when I was finishing it, when I was in my last year of university, I knew it was time to do student housing investment. Mm-hmm. And it would have made more sense for me to do London because that's where I'm from. Like That's where my family is and everything, just outside of London. But so the numbers didn't really make as much sense as Windsor. And this is even well, if you're gonna relocate, three yeah. years ago. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. But that's where the boom happened. 2017, things started right. to make a lot less sense. Like when mm-hmm. I was buying single family homes, like 900 square feet for 200 grand in London, that was sweet. Those, yes. were, those were good days. Yes, those were. <laughs> yeah. And then it was, uh, you know, once that same house was going for 350, now it's like 400. Right. It's, it is a lot more risk exposure. And I can tell you, rents haven't gone up like that. I mean, rents have gone up maybe 20, 30%. But you know what's happened though? The yeah. interest rates have gone down proportionally. Sure. So there is, there is an adjustment there, but it's not the same opportunity. It's, it's it was. risky too, because yeah. you know the interest rates are not set in stone forever. So you know if you're buying at those prices because the low interest rate makes the deal work, always what I always do is increase the interest rate. Right now, double it because of how low it is. Just put in your, just see if it works. Do the numbers yeah. still work with the current rents? That's a great, that's a great thing to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's all about your plan A, B, and C, like making sure that even if things don't work out exactly as you want them to, can you still make this work in some way? Yeah. I'm, I'm the doomsday king. So like whenever I'm about to invest in something, I attack it from every single angle. Like all, I'll, I'll like stay how up can to, I lose? Yeah. Yes. And I, I try my best to prove it wrong as a bad investment. And I say, what if this scenario happens yeah. or this, and if it still passes, then, then I feel confident going yeah, forward. Yeah, and it's good if you have somebody who's, who's in the industry who knows what you're doing that you mm-hmm. can kind of like spitball with and say, hey, here's what I'm worried about. And like, what do you think? Especially if they're right in your market. That's, right. that's super yeah. critical. 
Um, okay, so Marco, any tips? I mean, you're brand new at this, um, getting in, but you've moved really fast and uh, mm -hmm. you're having a lot of success. So tips for people who are you know, getting started and, uh, and want to move quick, what would you suggest? People lie, numbers don't lie. So do your numbers, make sure you're doing your homework, never yeah. invest in something because somebody else told you to do it or because you see someone else having success in a certain area. Do your own numbers. If your numbers work and they work very well, then do that investment. Yeah. And to add to that, don't force your numbers to work and don't yes. change your criteria just because you can't find a deal that works. That's the worst. You know what? Everyone's guilty of doing it once or twice when you really love it. Well, what if I could bring the cost by, <laughs> per square foot down? Yeah, maybe you we'll know, do it 25. a little cheaper. Yeah. Don't do that. You're right. Good tip, Andrew. We've, we've all been saved. Uh, I shouldn't say we've all, but I've been saved by things, appreciation. things appreciating while I was doing the job. It's worth more than I thought it was. It's been quite easy the last five years to do well in real estate. It's not, it's not hard to look smart in real estate if you've owned over the last five years. Um, it's the people who can survive the downturns who have hedged and have a, a contingency plan that when things don't go great, um, they can still make it work. And that to me, cash flow is your lifeblood. If you, if you have For that, sure. if you have that in abundance, even if your rents go down, even if your value goes down, you're like, well, you know what? My mortgage is paying off. I'm still making money. Absolutely. I'm okay. Yeah. I want to add one more part to my tip. I look at every single individual property as a business. I even call them business. Sometimes you'll hear on my YouTube channel, I call them businesses. Yeah. Look at it like you're buying a grocery store or something, right? Like what is the income that this is producing? What income are we expecting this to produce in the next five years or so, right? What am I paying for? You know, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. It's, it's really simple. Um, I like that businesses and, I, and then the money for that property belongs to that business. That's what I like to think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll take out money, of course, but I try and I let them grow quite significantly. I first. do it a different way. So I live off of my cash flow and I don't let myself spend $1 more than my cash flow. So if I want a Mercedes Benz, it has to be bought from passive income. That's the way I do it. But every single dollar of earned income I get, I don't get to touch it. It all goes into my investments. So your real estate business, not a single as a cent have I touched it? No. Beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's a great strategy. So everyone mm -hmm. has their own system. I think that's an awesome system. Yeah. It, it seems to work well for you. Uh, Marco, if people wanted to follow you or reach out to you, mm -hmm. where should we send them? Sure. So YouTube channel is where I do like more instructional videos and things like that. So just my first and last name, Marco Ugbaba. You might have to spell it. in, in So the you don't bio. pronounce the G pretty much. Ugbaba. Yeah. Ugbaba. Ugbaba. It is a G. Okay, I'm working on Ugbaba. it. We'll have another <laughs> podcast about how to pronounce Marco's last name. You know, and Maybe then, if you could just do like a two minute, <laughs> uh, break down the syllables. <laughs> have like the letters on the, on the, yeah. on the screen and stuff. And then uh, for Instagram, it's Marco Ugba. Also, Instagram, definitely make sure to follow me. You see my day to day. Um, yeah, sounds so, good. Yeah, those probably are the post two. more than I do. Yeah. We're close. We're close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've been joking about that. <laughs> one day, one day I'll start posting more. Um, okay. I, I really appreciate you coming on, uh, sharing your wisdom. I think that a lot of people are going to get uh, a little boost of confidence seeing what you've been able to do so quick. Um, one final question, just because I forgot mm -hmm. to ask it. What kind of seed capital did you have coming into all this? What, did, what was your first property you bought? How much were you bringing in? Yeah, well, when I, when I turned 17, I put $1,200 into the stock market. I turned that into 100000 by the time I graduated from university. So I sold that. Half of it went to paying off my tuition because university is expensive. So I pretty much had maybe around like $40,000 to start. Yeah, this is what I meant when I said stone cold killer. The, <laughs> the, the attitude is there, like the no excuses attitude. That's the most critical part. Yes. So uh, you've got that. This is going to be fun to watch what you do, uh, what you do over the next couple of I years. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Well, man, thanks for dropping up. Awesome. Okay, talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> <laughs>